Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this third Sunday in Lent. Hard to, hard to believe we're already at the third Sunday in Lent, and it is good to have you here as we continue our focus not only on the season of Lent, but also on what it means to celebrate the Sabbath. Today is our Sabbath day, and I'd like to invite the children and the youth to come join me for the beginning of our Sabbath time together. I'm a child. So, people have been worshiping for like three to four thousand years and starting worship often with the sound of an instrument, like an instrument calling them to worship. And so if you think about it, it's a way to kind of quiet everybody down, but what does it feel like when you hear an instrument? What do you, what does it, how does it make you feel? It depends on the instrument. It depends on the instrument. Very good. Yeah, that's true. What happy. are some of the different feelings? Happy. Happy? Yes. Stress, especially if you're the one playing the instrument. Stress sad. if you're playing it, but maybe sad. Sad and be sad, too. Or like excited. Or excited, yeah. If it's a sad song or something like that, it usually doesn't make you feel anything. If it's just blue, it's probably because I'm playing it and I don't have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> So it can also it can also make us like kind of feel relaxed, and that's that's what I think the singing bowl does. So when we start worship, the Sabbath, we talk about Sabbath as rest, and it's a time to relax with God in God's presence. And so uh, today, before you all have a chance to ring it as we go into a worship, I'm I'm going to I'm going to make it sing first, and I want you to everybody just take a deep breath. We're here to relax together in God's presence. We're here to worship. You're going to have to listen for it. You hear it coming? our day of Sabbath. Let us worship God.
Please rise in body and spirit as you are able, and let us lift our voices responsibly for our call to worship. Let all who yearn for connection, all who hunger for justice and thirst for bodily renewal, come and be replenished. With hope and expectation, we bring all that our souls desire. Let everyone weary from isolation or overwhelmed by life's troubles come and find rest in God's care. All those who come seeking community are received in holy embrace. May the presence and provision of God be manifest among us that all may have what they need. We, we come, come to give, we, we come, come to receive, we come to grow in love. Please remain standing for our prayer of confession. God, you are a storyteller, and you made us in your image. You spoke and you still speak through unexpected people, through silence and through your word, written and proclaimed through the centuries. We come to hear your story once again, to find our place among your people and within your vision for all creation. You call us to share your story in your words and in our actions, but we confess that more often our lips are sealed. We are afraid to tell your story. We think we don't know enough. And we are afraid of offending. Speak, Speak to us and through us, the Lord. Help us to know you so well that we cannot help but love you. And to love you so much, we cannot help but serve you. We pray in the name of the one who is your living word, Jesus the Christ. The grace of God is always doing a new thing. Whether we are prepared or think we are worthy or not, let yourself live and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
our Sabbath poem today from Wendell Berry is called, How Long Does It Take to Make the Woods? How long does it take to make the woods? As long as it takes to make the world. The woods is present as the world is. The presence of all its past and of all its time to come. It's always finished. It's always being made. The act of its making forever greater than the act of its destruction. It's a part of eternity for its end and beginning belong to the end and beginning of all things. The beginning lost in the end, the end in the beginning. What is the way to the woods? How do you go there? By climbing up through the six days field, kept in all the body's years, the body's sorrow, weariness, and joy. By passing through the narrow gate on the far side of that field, where the pasture grass of the body's life gives way to the high, original standing of the trees. By coming into the shadow, the shadow of the grace of that straight ways ending. The shadow of the mercy of light. Why must the gate be narrow? Because you cannot pass beyond it burdened. To come into the woods, you must leave behind the six days world. All of it. All of its plans and hopes. You must come without weapon or tool alone. Expecting nothing. Remembering nothing into the ease of sight, the brotherhood of eye and leaf. service today. Thanks to Kelly and Preston Childers for singing for us and extra special thanks to Sharon Sanders for filling in on piano and organ today. Always always a pleasure to have you all with us. 
Confirmation is a time that's not a part of every church tradition. Some of you all did not get confirmed because it wasn't a part of your tradition. For us, confirmation is a special part of the tradition after the kids either have their parents um, make promises of baptism or they make promises of baptism, there's another opportunity when they become like 12, 13, 14, 15, 11, you know, all in that kind of age range, that they get to go through confirmation classes and make a decision for themselves to be a part of the church and think through their faith. And so it really is, um, it's a special time. In fact, yesterday, part of that was there was a confirmation retreat here at St. Andrew with two of our other UCC churches and our kids made the banner that you see hanging on the pulpit there um, as a part of that learning. The thing that's really special about these three kids is that these three kids, not only do they have amazing insights and ideas about things, they're three of our most involved youth. You see them all the time. They're around, they're here, they're involved, they're excited about being here. They're excited about being a part of this community with all of you. So it's a real treat to get to hear them um, come up and present their faith statements. And then on Palm Sunday, they will be confirmed. And that will be a day of celebration as well. But today they're going to present to us something that they've written for themselves because it's not about what uh, it's not about what we tell them to believe or what their parents tell you to believe. It's about them sharing a little bit about what they think with you today. So I'm getting the privilege of inviting you guys up. Do you want to all be up here all at once to support one another? Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, we'll do this one. Well, Trenton, um, we're so grateful for mentors as well through this whole process. Um, Trenton's mentor, David Sickert, met with him uh, to help prepare this statement, and then Lake Caldwell met with Rue, and Judy Johnson met with Kira as well. But as you guys come up, Trenton, you're first. You ready to go? I know your name's first, just means you gotta go first. That darn alphabetical order, right? <laughs> I believe that God is my guiding light and that they shall lead me to be a better person and help me care for others. This is a message we have heard and declared to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1-15 God shows me how to be generous and caring to love and share. God guides me to help the helpless and protect the vulnerable. I believe that God wants the people who have more to help those with less so everyone has enough. Love each and every person. Do not hate others for being different, but love them for being different. Hate stirs up strife, but love covers all offensives. Proverbs 10, 12. Help all those below yourself. Respect the earth. Don't litter, don't pollute. Respect God and all they do. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew 22, 36-40. Jesus is the one who holds a torch that spreads the light of God. I know that sounds a bit churchy, but it's true. But I feel it is true. He guides all of us and helps us every day. He leads us to help others and guides us to be better people. I want St. Andrew to be a community where I can be me with no judgment, where I don't have to be a fake person. I want St. Andrew to reach everyone who needs it, have no boundaries, and protect everyone. I believe that the most important Bible story is the prodigal son. Most of you probably know it. But in case you didn't, here's a synopsis. The kid asks his dad for his inheritance early, and sells the land and takes the money and goes out on a big gambling spree. Well, he ends up broke and having to search through pig troughs to get enough to eat. But the pigs always eat it before he gets there. Then he gets an idea. He goes back to his dad and asks for forgiveness. His dad says yes, but his brother gets really mad because this guy just left the family behind. But the dad explained that his son had died and had come back, that he was reborn. I don't believe this was literal. I believe that he was reborn in God, like all of us can be forgiven and reborn in God as well. Thank you for your time.
I remember when I first came here very, very well. I was eight, I think. And I had the sad news that we had to leave our other church, Lynnhurst, where my mom was working at that time. I was said that I wanted to get baptized there, but I said that I wanted to look for a different church. I, we went to two different churches, but then I went here. Boy, this was surely the weirdest and funnest church I've been to. <laughs> it, was, it was Thanksgiving lunch, lunch, and the kindness you guys showed me was unnecessary, but you guys convinced me to get baptized there. Here, the, the years I've spent here and, and I plan on spending here have been and all will be amazing, I'm sure of that. When I got baptized, I felt happy and sure that I was going to stay here, and, the day, and to this day, I'm sure I am going to stay here. I'm still confused about my faith and God and stuff, but I feel like you guys are going to help me figure this all out. I've always loved this church, from the snacks to the saucy nights, and also sometimes the sermons. <laughs> but one thing I love more than anything else is that you guys care. You guys care if I'm sick, if you if I wander somewhere, and you guys respect everyone's choices except if you killed someone, which that's just wrong. Um, don't do that. Um, and I hope that when I join the church, I'll I'll be ama uh, I'll be just like the rest of you, this amazing church. I had to I had to choose between my dad's and my mom's church my whole entire life. But for some reason, I've always felt drawn to the UCC church. But now, that, but now that I'm more active in my dad's church, I felt sad about the fact that I'll never get to join the church of Latter-day Saints. But to be honest, I've always known. I always knew that I was gonna end up in the UCC. But of course, I'll always go be a part of the Latter-day Saints church because I enjoy the church and I like it. But I will, I will be here for the rest of the time whether it's this church or another UCC church, so you stuck with me. <laughs> when I was a child, I would yell, yay God, after every prayer I was done, that was done, and I still do it. So if you guys could do me a favor, once I say amen, because I like ending stuff with amen, could you guys maybe say yay God back? Because why not? not? So thank you guys for the kindness and love you've given me. Amen. Yay God! Well, hi. <laughs> okay. I've been at Simeon Group for as long as I can remember. I'm sure a lot of you remember me when I was two feet tall and running around after my siblings like a maniac. But when I think about in a short while, I'll be an official member of this church, I think it's fair to say that it's a little scary. But I think the most important part about the community is our responsibility. <laughs> and also, being a part of this community, you can help people. And I think that's probably my most favorite thing about this church, helping other people. Being a part of the UCC, you can expect a lot of diversity. And being exposed to that kind of welcomeness and kindness has changed me for the better. That kindness is exactly what makes this church a support system for not only me, and probably a lot of you. St. Andrew has also given me so many role models, from Lori and Emma to Judy, and everyone sitting out there in front of me. Now, while talking about role models, I'm sure if any of you think of me as a role model, you should probably track or <laughs> check my track record first. <laughs> from the number of shenanigans that come to my mind thinking of this church, from Easter egg hunts to singing in the children's choir, to even losing my front two teeth, here, <laughs> it would be a little concerning. I've learned a lot from not only the community, but also some of the sermons. <laughs> but I think the main message, and I know some of you might not have heard of this one, but um, love your neighbor as yourself. It's the most important one for me, at least. I have a lot of friends of diverse backgrounds from Africa to Asia anywhere and some of them are muslim jewish and even atheist but i never thought that of being a problem of being their friend and i'm not really a religious person but i think the essence of what god is trying to tell us is important and is good so i've been here for a long time and i'm happy for that <laughs> I don't know if 
I can top those statements. But this is the scripture for this morning. It comes from John chapter 4, verse 5 through 42. And so he came to Samaria, city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by the journey, was sitting by the well. It was noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you the greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to this to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Then Jesus said to her, I am the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, 
Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, my, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. May we hear the still speaking God in these words. God is still speaking. <clears throat> Today than yesterday. Got the tomatoes planted. 
visiting Mrs. Brown. That's it. It turned out I didn't have to read a lot of other entries because they were almost all the same. Just the facts, Jack. Yeah. No reflection, no emotion, no details. I wish I had had the chance to ask her why she didn't say more in her own diary. Did she just not get in touch with her feelings? Or did she think they weren't important? Certainly important enough to write down? Or was she worried about one of her nosy grandchildren like me finding it someday? <laughs> I've written things down in journals a little bit over the years, and I always have the thought in my head, am I okay with my kids reading this someday? And I imagine that every single one of us has things that we can write about, feelings, thoughts, experiences, escapades, that we want to keep hidden to some degree. Most of us have things that fall into the category of the stuff where I would die if everyone in the whole world knew this. And maybe those are things that we actually did that we don't want people to know. Seems like those things that we don't want people to know about usually fall into the categories of sex, alcohol and drugs, stealing or violence. And maybe they also include things like times that we were really nasty to other people, or times when looking back we realized how self-centered we were. Times that we lied or manipulated others if we're able to acknowledge that to ourselves or terrible thoughts that we had. You see, we all have things that we feel shame about. We all have things that we're sure that others would judge us for. <clears throat> Excuse me. We all have things that we know other people would judge us for if they only knew. We all have things we regret and things we just don't want to admit to, sometimes even to ourselves. And so now imagine encountering someone and discovering that he knows everything about you, all of it. And instead of walking away, he visits with you, engages with you, is loving toward you, and then offers you emotional and spiritual healing and a sense of peace in God's presence. That's how it seems to have happened for the woman at the well, when Jesus asked her for a cup of water and then offered her the living water. We get the impression that Jesus knew all about her and still loved her. And she is the one that Jesus tells that he is the Messiah. Usually Jesus didn't say anything to people about him being the Messiah, but to this woman who is talking about the Messiah coming someday, to her, in this private moment between the two of them, to her he says, I am he. It's quite an encounter they have. Jesus, thirsty for water after walking a long way that morning and arriving at the well, reminding us of his humanity. One of the most human things is to become thirsty. And then the woman, thirsty for love and acceptance and connection. The exchange that they have is really wonderful. The woman fills Jesus' cup with water, and then he gives her a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, as he says. Now, some biblical commentators have traditionally depicted this text as Jesus calling the woman out on her five husbands in a critical way, judging her. But many commentators don't think that is in the text at all. They're the ones I agree with. Jesus, it really seems, is not speaking judgment and critique about her. He's simply speaking the truth about the life she has had. You have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. 
Imagine it that Jesus is simply naming her pain and her struggles. But see, over the years, unfortunately, a lot of biblical interpretation has depicted women in the Bible often in one of two ways, either virgin and pure or prostitute and whore. And often not a lot of in-between. And this woman has often been spoken of like she is come some kind of sleazy woman having seduced five husbands. But the truth is that for a woman in biblical times to have had five husbands, either her husbands died and she kept remarrying, often the husband's brothers, if they had them. And if she had had five husbands die, that would have been a lot to go through. Or she had five husbands because they divorced her. And it was easy for men to divorce and practically impossible for women. And that would have put her in a really bad spot in society because her worth and livelihood came through being married. So the many marriages was likely not something that she made happen. And yet it does seem that she probably felt bad about her past and that she felt ostracized because of it. After all, she came to the well at noon, the highest heat of the day, a time perhaps when the other townspeople wouldn't be there. And it makes us wonder if it was to avoid seeing other people who were gonna look at her and talk. There's the woman with the five husbands and now she's living with somebody else. We don't know why. And then Jesus, he comes right out with her past. He just names it. And right as he names it, he's offering her living water and eternal life and grace. And then later she tells others that he knew everything about her. I'm sure that she had things that she felt shame about and regretted. I'm sure of it because I have things I feel shame about and regret. And all of us do. But it's like Jesus saying to the woman at the well, and to you and me too, I know everything about you. I see you. I see all of you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I still see you as worthy of love and grace. Another thing to note about this story is that Jesus and the woman, they both offered something to the other. Actual water and living water. Jesus is giving and receiving from her. It's a mutual relationship. And he's sitting with her, modeling community and connection and relationship. Not hierarchy, not judgment, not one up. He's sitting with her, modeling what community can be like. And then what came next is really pretty amazing. The woman went back to the city and told people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. In other words, come see this man who knows all about me and still offered me living water, still offered me newness of life in God. And then perhaps even more amazing is in verse 39, where we read, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. <clears throat> many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She encountered Jesus and it didn't stop there. She went and she told others. Her encounter with Jesus, it made a difference in her life. And it showed in her action. I think it brings up a good question for us. What difference does it make in our lives when we encounter Jesus? When we encounter community? Catholic theologian James Allison describes faith not as something intellectual with 
a set of theological propositions, but he describes faith as relaxing in the love and presence of God. He says, faith is relaxing in the love and presence of God in the way we relax in the presence of someone we're certain is fond of us. Think about that. Think about how much more relaxed you are when you're with someone that you know cares about you. When we're in the presence of someone we're certain is fond of us, we're funnier, more spontaneous, softer, less defended. If I know for sure someone likes and loves me, there's no reason to pretend anything. Allison says, faith is relaxing. I think that's what happened to the woman at the well. It's as if the living water found a crack in her defenses. She had to have felt defensive. And as if that living water trickled down to her lowest point, to her deepest wounds, to her greatest need, and she finally had some of her thirst quenched. James Allison's description of faith being relaxing in the love and presence of God is really what Sabbath rest is all about. Relaxing in the love and presence of God. Think about our Sabbath today. Three youth who are relaxed enough in your presence, in our presence, to let us hear not just the facts of their lives, but to let us hear some of their deeper thoughts. Our Sabbath time today is a time of encountering word and music and smiling faces of old and new friends. It's a place for naming joys and struggles, a place for telling the truth of our lives and knowing we'll be accepted and loved. Sabbath is a time for offering water and receiving water, a time for giving and a time for receiving. That's why the liturgy is a giving and receiving. Does it make a difference in our lives when we encounter Jesus in the scriptures? Does it make a difference in our lives when we encounter each other, offering one another strength and courage and grace and understanding? Our kids said that he does. Does it make a difference in our lives when we practice Sabbath, when we rest in God? when we relax in the love and presence of God, here, together. I believe it does make a difference. And if you believe that it does, then let's go out and tell others. Come and see. God of prayer today, you will see that there is a call and response when I read 
Lord, in your mercy, please respond with hear our prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation, hear our prayers for all who thirst today. We pray for those who are spiritually thirsty, who long to know your presence, to sink into the relaxing comfort of the one who knows all of us, every single part, and loves us unconditionally. We pray for those who long to know your presence but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who feel alone and without hope, those who long to feel needed and loved, those who are searching for meaning and purpose. Lord, in your mercy, in your mercy. we pray for all who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough, enough water to drink or feed their animals, whose fields are parched, whose crops have withered, who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive, or who have to be content with water that is unclean and unsafe. We pray for those whose homes, villages, and cities are torn apart because of war, because of drought, because of famine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for an equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations, those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working hard to find clean water and make it available to those who need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we ask that you would open our hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice, to stand alongside those who are thirsty, so that all people everywhere may live without want or fear, and may discover the abundant life that you promised each one. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water, we pray the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. about the invitation to give today, know that today's special offering is for our One Great Hour of Sharing, which supports disaster refugee development ministries. Uh, we're thankful there wasn't a disaster just the other night with that tornado coming through, but of course many folks have experienced that. And so we are able to give 
and in that way be a larger part of a community that supports others. I also want to let you know a lot of the folks that are watching online are members of our church, but others um, are folks that have found us online. And so to all of you, you're invited to go to our website if you'd like to support our church and, and give us a donation. And to all of you who are gathered here as well, not only can you give through our offering plates, but going online is actually, I have found a helpful way to do my offerings sometime. When you get online, all of the special offerings that we have are listed in there. And sometimes, I know we try to do a good job of announcing everything and putting all the um, offerings in here, and it can get to be a lot. When you get on our website and you hit the donate, you can see all of the things that um, give to, including the general fund. And it's really kind of a helpful way to get yourself organized with that. I found it helpful for me, and I wanted to share that with you, that even if you're here every Sunday, it's still a wonderful way sometimes to give. And so give from your heart. Give knowing that those gifts will be blessed in this community and beyond.
welcome you and thank you for your words you've shared with us today. I know, you're so excited. <laughs> <laughs> and so now to all of you, as you go from this space, go with the peace of Christ in your hearts. Go knowing that you are loved, accepted, forgiven, and offered gifts of eternal life. May the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and may you share it with others. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.